All right, everyone, thank you and welcome to the first ComStack of 2021 in a public meeting. Uh, this is going to be a great, great opportunity for the FAA and uh, especially the Office of Commercial Space Transportation to get some great feedback from industry and from ComStack. Uh, I am looking forward to a great discussion period. Uh, as we go through, uh, you who have tuned in either via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, or here through uh, Zoom, uh, or the, the ComStack uh, website, uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so please feel free to put your questions in. Uh, we won't have you come up live and ask the question, but you can certainly ask the, the question in the Q&A section uh, on Zoom or send it in via email. Uh, that information will be coming up shortly. Uh, I do ask the, the ComStack members, please feel free to chime in and have a great discussion. Uh, we will have uh, a little change to the agenda this morning. Uh, we're, we're having some technical difficulties getting some people in. Uh, as we all know, Zoom and Teams and whatever whatever communication system that people are using these days to do virtual meetings, it doesn't always work exactly like we want it to, exactly like we hope it will. Uh, sometimes things just don't work quite like we think it will. Uh, so we'll, we'll be getting back on track shortly. But right up front, I would like to introduce uh, Wayne Monteith, the Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation. Uh, we'll have him speak first. Uh, and uh, Wayne, over to you. Uh, thank you for being here and addressing ComStack this morning. Hey, th thanks a lot, Jim. Really appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and I guess uh, flexibility is now the key to space power. Uh, I want to start off with uh, thanking in advance uh, our administrator, uh, FAA's administrator, uh, Steve Dixon, our acting or the acting administrator for NASA, Steve Jerzyk, uh, Dave Turner from the Department of State, and of course, our ComStack members. And a big thank you to all the members of the public that are here today. I appreciate and I'm grateful that you're taking the time out of your busy schedules to learn more about the FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Office. You know, less than 24 months ago, the Department of Transportation reformed, reorganized, and re-energized ComStack to be a more nimble, effective, and responsive advisory committee. And the results have simply been outstanding. In June 2020, less than a year ago, FAA asked ComStack to evaluate and advise on eight detailed and critical issues, including uh, commercial human spaceflight, spaceflight reform, and research and development opportunities. And in September, you began to deliver. You laid out detailed recommendations on best practices for human spaceflight, as well as infrastructure funding at our spaceports. Today, you're prepared to deliver on all of the remaining taskers, recommending changes to pre-application consultation, international dual licensing, R&D priorities, our next regulatory streamlining project and other areas. The amount and quality of your work, uh, of the work that you have produced, as I've said, is simply outstanding. Your recommendations and white papers are detailed and helpful. We will closely examine what you have produced as we continue to transform AST for the ongoing surge of activity in the commercial space transportation industry. I wanna thank you for your efforts and hard work. I particularly wanna recognize and thank Comstack Chairs Charity Whedon and Karina Dries, as well as the working group chairs, Greg, Ar <coughs> excuse me, Greg Aut Autry, uh, <coughs> uh, Robbie Sabathier, Shanna Dale, Clay Mowry, and Paul Damfus. I also want to take a moment to recognize a colleague who passed away late last year, former Senator David Carnes. Not only was he a great public servant, he was a key member of Comstack, providing keen insight and fresh perspective. His contributions were invaluable and he will be missed. Looking ahead, today's meeting should be very interesting. We've improved our technical abilities, or so we thought, 
uh, to allow for more public input and discussion in the Zoom webinar room. So please be sure to take advantage of that. We've also got a slate of new areas for Comstack to consider and advise on that we will discuss at the end of the meeting. Because in our industry, the reward for a job well done is of course, more work. So thanks again, Jim. Thanks to our Comstack chairs uh, and Comstack members and to the members of the public for joining us here today. And so with, with that, let's go ahead and move on with our program. All right, thank you, Wayne. I appreciate that and uh, words for Comstack. And I definitely agree uh, the work Comstack has done has just been outstanding. And I am definitely looking forward to hearing more today and great discussion uh, about what is uh, their recommendations and then moving forward as well. So we are, are back on track and I would like to introduce the acting NASA administrator, uh, Steve Jerzyk. Uh, great American and uh, looking forward to what he has to say. And then once he is done speaking uh, for the Comstack members, uh, you will have an opportunity to ask some questions. So Mr. Jerzyk, over to you, sir. Hey, thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to address the Comstack this morning. Um, yeah, commercial space, transportation, commercial space transportation is vital to NASA uh, and the nation and the world. And I'm grateful to all of you support, for supporting a critical, Amer a critical American innovation and entrepreneurship in, uh, in space and aerospace. Um, I've been, the, been in this business a long time. It, it's a really challenging business and we really need a kind of an all hands on deck approach with uh, our government partners and our industry partners to be successful, um, not only now, but in the future. Um, I'd also like to begin by, um, by saying we look forward to working with uh, Secretary uh, Buttigieg um, and, uh, and partnering with him um, and the Department of Transportation. Uh, my understanding is that uh, as a child, the secretary wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I, I also wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and while acting as a regulator isn't quite as exciting as going up on a rocket into space, uh, I assure you that efficient and effective rules are very important to the future of, of uh, NASA and space exploration. I also wanted to thank uh, FAA Administrator Dixon for his support in January. Uh, the administrator signed a memorandum of understanding on behalf of the FAA with NASA, which has already helped to further define and enact joint activities between our two organizations. Uh, also wanted to acknowledge Wayne Monteith, uh, the FAA Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation, who's been an architect for a bold commercial future. Uh, Wayne and the FAA AST team um, did an outstanding job revising the commercial launch regulations, and I appreciate all the work um, that uh, has been done to support the needs of not only NASA, but our private sector transportation providers as well. Again, we could not do what we the, the missions that we have planned without our commercial partners. Um, much work remains to be done as we turn to advisory circulars, and I know the NASA team is already engaged to ensure that U.S. commercial launch licensing processes create the safe and prosperous future in space that we're all striving for. Um, moreover, on behalf of myself and all of us at NASA, I'd like to thank Gabriel Swinney for his extraordinary work on the Artemis Accords and the Gateway Memorandum MOUs with our national partners, the partnership between um, NASA and the Department of State on these. and many other efforts have resulted in tremendous policy successes that would not have been possible without Gabriel's deep expertise, uh, creativity, and commitment. I'm uh, going to go off script a little bit here and also thank um, Mike Gold. Um, Mike um, came to NASA a year and a half ago and, uh, and just has been just amazing uh, for NASA, um, for advancing our commercial space partnerships and interest and for um, get, putting the Artemis Accords in place and getting nine countries to sign on to the Accords. And there are more countries that are ready to, uh, additional countries that are ready to sign on for. And I can talk for a long time about all the, um, about Mike's leadership um, at NASA and what we've been able to accomplish uh, 
given his leadership. So I just a big thank you, big thank you to Mike Gold. Um, additionally, I'd want to acknowledge the chair of the Constack, Char Charity Whedon, for her leadership of the, this essential group. And congratulations to Charity on the successful launch of Ratchet Scales uh, Elsa, Elsa D mission. I look forward to seeing that mission unfold and demonstrate that um, critical capability for, uh, for making sure that uh, our um, space environment is, uh, is safe for the future. Uh, also, I'm also grateful ca for ca uh, Karina Dries for her work on both the ComStack and at the Commercial Space Flight Federation. Uh, advisory committees play a significant role, particularly in this era of public-private partnerships, and I greatly appreciate Charity, Karina, and all the members of the ConStap uh, volunteering their time to provide the FAA and the Department of Transportation uh, with invaluable advice and counsel. Uh, we are in a new age of space development full of limitless opportunities. I, I can't tell you how exciting it is to be in this business at this point in time. Um, I, when I give particularly when I give public talks, I, I absolutely talk about how um, with, uh, with through public private partnerships and our international partners, ha the possibilities for advancing all of our space goals and objectives uh, are just sort of just getting started and just, just starting to gain momentum. So it's just an incredible time to be in, in the space business, um, satellite constellations, CubeSats, orbital servicing, assembly and manufacturing, reusable launch vehicles are transforming the space industry and, and many other technologies and innovations. Uh, at NASA, we have and will continue to act as a catalyst and a customer for these innovative capabilities. However, as commercial systems evolve and proliferate, it's vital that we protect the environment that sustains and supports all of our space-based activities. Um, in January, NASA and the FAA executed a, an MOU, which among many important topics, described how NASA and the FAA will work together to preserve and protect the orbital environment. And last month, NASA issued its Space Conjunction Assessment and Collision Avoidance Best Practices Handbook. Um, by sharing our own best practices, we hope that this handbook will assist the private sector, sector to support safe and successful operations um, in orbit. Uh, we are working uh, with both the Department of Transportation and the Department of Commerce to host an industry day to further discuss the handbook and obtain private sector input, which is really critical. Um, the feedback we receive from industry will inform a second iteration of the handbook, um, and we expect the handbook to continue to evolve as both NASA and commercial space companies continue to gain operational experience with these new uh, dynamic systems. So we want to enable innovation and enable new commercial space activities, but do that in a way that uh, is safe and preserves the, the orbital environment. It's of course critical that we all work together to preserve the orbital environment, critical component of space-based activities that um, our, modern society, our modern society depends on. Uh, at the same time, I believe the challenges we face in orbit are opportunities for inter innovation and entrepreneurism. Um, with government and industry working together, we can support technologies that can remove debris and perhaps even convert such debris into useful construction materials. And I believe that leveraging America's entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit not only can overcome the challenges of an increasingly congested environment, but also that the solutions we create will lead to an even bolder and brighter future in space uh, for all of humanity to enjoy. Um, beyond avoiding conjunctions, we are working on global on a global basis to establish norms of behavior in space. Um, again, the Artemis Accords, which Michael did an amazing job developing and and getting support for, um, have now been signed by nine countries, including the U.S., uh, and and articulate a series of principles to ensure that these activities uh, conducted under the Artemis program are implemented in a manner that fully complies with the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, the Registration Convention, and the Agreement on the Rescue of Astronauts, as well as uh, beneficial practices such as full, free, timely, and public release of scientific data. The Artemis program will be the largest and most diverse human spaceflight exploration coalition in history. We expect that over the course of the coming months and years, more countries will join the Artemis program and commit to the principles of the Artemis Accords. Although the Artemis Accords represent a strong initial start, there is much work that remains to be done to establish responsible norms of behavior in space. Specifically, along with the departments of state and defense, uh, we'll participate in an inter inter interagency process 
to support the development of norms of behavior and space for national security operations. Additionally, uh, we look forward to working with the departments of transportation, commerce, and industry to ensure that any future norms of behavior, rules, and regulations for commercial space activities support safety while bolstering innovation and entrepreneurial development. NASA is leveraging public-private partnerships more than ever before, and commercial space, space transportation is a key aspect of the Artemis program. Our modern lunar exploration program and moon to Mars approach have received su strong support from the Biden administration. Uh, the Space Launch System rocket, Orion spacecraft, um, ground systems at Kennedy Space Center, the Gateway in lunar orbit, and a commercial human landing system are the backbone of our exploration plans. We are using commercial providers to build and launch the initial gateway capabilities, as well as deliver supplies to the orbiting lunar outpost. For the next Americans, including the first woman, step foot on the surface of the moon. They will have arrived on the first human landing system built by American commercial partners. Head of the Artemis Generation astronauts uh, from the U.S. and our national partners on lunar missions, we're working with the private sector on commercial lunar payload services leveraging robotic commercial landers to explore more of the moon and unlock its secrets. Moreover, we're partnering with industry to develop ways to extract and utilize space resources to ensure that we can create a sustainable presence on the moon and subsequently utilize such techniques to support a future human mission to Mars. Um, Audermis is a NASA program, but is being fueled by commercial capabilities. In low Earth orbit, commercial partnerships are more important than ever. We must quickly and thoroughly work to support both innovative commercial use of the International Space Station while developing a private sector successor. In LEO, I'm encouraged by the robust interest in private astronaut missions, and NASA officials are working with the FAA AST to ensure that such activities can be conducted safely and successfully. I also could not be more proud of our commercial partners um, who have supported and sustained the International Space Station for over 20 years now. Uh, commercial cargo delivery of the ISS has become routine, and next month I'm looking forward to what will be the third mission to carry astronauts uh, to the station aboard a commercial system, and that's the, th the third SpaceX um, mission, which we call Crew-2. Closer to Earth, but of equal importance, are the development of commercial suborbital, uh, suborbital systems uh, last year, for the first time, NASA selected a proposal that included a crew tended payload under the Flight Opportunities Program, and we're exploring how NASA could utilize suborbital commercial space flight systems to support crew training and other agency needs. Per our MOU with the FAA, we're hopeful that not only will suborbital crew transportation vehicles serve as platforms for science and astronautics, but also could lead to development of point-to-point -point travel, a capability that may revolutionize transportation. The aviation in industry plays a vital role in bolstering U.S. exports, creating numerous jobs throughout the country. Point-to-point -point travel represents a singular opportunity to create a new and innovative capability that could benefit this nation and the world for decades to come. Finally, I want to emphasize how diversity is key to achieving success and moving the space industry forward. When working with commercial partners, I am always pleased to see both youth and diversity among the new cadre of space professionals. Uh, space is hard. Exploring and eventually settling the final frontier has and will continue to present complex and difficult challenges. Only by being inclusive and harnessing all of America will we be able to leverage the wide variety of perspectives and experiences necessary to solve problems that will allow our nation's grand journey of discovery into space reach farther than ever before. Again, I'm grateful to all of you for contributing your time and expertise to the ComStack and for everything that your companies are doing to support our activities at NASA. We're depending upon all of you to join us in transforming the dream of a robust and prosperous future in space for America and the entire world into a reality. So with that, um, I think we hopefully have still have time for some questions. Absolutely, we have time for questions. So, ComStack panel members, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand and, and we'll make sure you're unmuted and get to speak. So, any questions out there? Chris, go ahead, please.
Chris, you're muted. Thank you very much for your comments. I was wondering if there's any initiatives to share uh, some of the exploration that's going on in the moon right now uh, by the Chinese. Have they been forthcoming and and billing, uh, being willing to work with NASA and and other uh, U.S. entities on, on what their discoveries include so far? Yeah, so um, as you're probably aware, we're, we're prohibited by law from working bilaterally with the Chinese. Um, so um, that makes it challenging to gain insights into their plans. And, um, and so most of what we know from the Chinese plans are comes, comes from, you know, public, you know, public disclosure by, uh, by the Chinese, by CNSA, by the Chinese. Um, we, we have engaged them in discussions. Um, uh, we have the ability to certify to Congress that we're, we have the protections in place with respect to uh, interacting with China and guarding information. We've, we've uh, done that certification several times to have conversations and coordinate with them on things like um, air traffic management uh, on the aero side um, and as well as earth science. Um, and most recently, we um, had an exchange with them on um, uh, them providing their um, orbital, orbital data, their ephemeris data for their uh, Tianwen-1 Mars orbiting mission so we could do conjunction analysis around, around Mars with the orbiters. Um, so we do have targeted engagement with them. We have the ability to certify to Congress that the engagement is appropriate and, and we have the safeguards in place. Um, you know, I think um, it's going to be up to the administration and Congress to determine, um, you know, uh, how we engage, if and how we engage with China on civil space activities as part of a broader, you know, strategy for uh, for the nation with with China. Um, but we look forward to, um, you know, as as the administration and Congress sets those policies, we look forward to seeing how we can contribute. Um, uh, with respect to uh, civil space dialogue and collaboration with China. Thank you for your comments. I think we might have time for one more and I might take the prerogative acting Minister Jurisdic. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I feel the term norms of behavior is the word du jour or <laughs> of the year. And I'd like to know what NASA feels the term means to them when it comes to the Artemis Accords and how private industry can help support those norms? Yeah. So, you know, for us, it, 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 it really means a set of rules of the road for operators that we're all um, adhering to, um, to ensure um, all, all both um, uh, defense, intelligence, civil space and commercial operators can operate their systems safely and effectively, um, you know, in, in, from LEO to GEO and then eventually out to cislunar space. Um, and it, but, and we do have to get down to the kind of specific, you know, spe, uh, specific guidance on, on that with respect to, um, you know, things like, uh, how, uh, how close you can approach one satellite can approach another and under, under which circumstances is that allowed and, and, uh, and, and to ensure that everybody is operating safely. So it, it, you know, we've outlined norms of behavior and art, the Artemis Accords that are consistent again with this outer space treaty and other, other, uh, agreements and conventions, but eventually we've got to get down to a set of specific, guidance to operators across defense, intelligence, civil space, and commercial that not only we agree to nationally, but we have agreed to internationally to make sure we can preserve the space environment and everybody can operate operate safely. So um, it, in general, I mean, that's what it means to, to us. I think, um, you know, right now, as I mentioned, the Department of Defense is pulling together what they believe are should be the norms of behavior in 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 Earth orbit environment. Um, we'll review those with a civil space lens, um, and uh, and then we'll we'll move those forward working with the State Department 
on how we gain consensus around those nationally, and then state will take the lead on on moving those forward with our internationally. So a lot of work to be done there, but it, it's it's really important that we, you know, up until now it's been more um, the good of the commons. You know, we all it's these unwritten uh, unwritten rules to operate and norms of behavior. Um, uh, some of them in it written, or some of them written in our space and others, but it's kind of been, you know, everybody voluntarily adheres to those norms for the the good of the commons. I think we need to be more specific in documenting them and uh, and getting a, and getting formal agreement both nationally and internationally that operators will adhere to them. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and I believe that's all the time we have. Uh, but before you leave, just want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's it's very refreshing and, and good to hear leadership talk about space flight safety in this manner. Um, so thank you. I know. Thank you. And again, thank you for all you're doing on the comm stack. And thanks to, to Wayne and his team at a a a FAAST. Really appreciate the partnership there. So thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, appreciate you taking the time this morning. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Dave Turner from the Department of State. He is uh, the head of the Space and Advanced Technology Office. So uh, Dave Turner, over to you. Okay, good morning. Uh, can you see me okay? Absolutely, sir. Thank you for being here and taking the time. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you and uh, thanks to those who've already spoken, uh, including Acting Administrator Jerzyk. Uh, we have a long-standing and strong partnership here with NASA on pursuing what is uh, obviously an important topic of discussion today already, norms of responsible behavior in space. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about our efforts in this regard, and I'm also sharing my time with uh, Gabriel Swinney, who's also been mentioned already today. Um, and let me just start by saying that our primary uh, responsibility here is to explain to the rest of the world that the United States does have oversight of uh, civil and commercial space activities uh, that protects safety and ensures responsible behavior in space while still enabling industry to grow and develop. Um, so I will start by uh, saying that responsible behavior is a major tenant of the new national space policy uh, released in December. Consistent with the previous policy, a guiding principle is that it is in the shared interest of all nations to act responsibly in space to ensure the safety, stability, security, and long-term sustainability of space activities. Uh, throughout the more detailed guidelines that are in the new policy, uh, departments and agencies in collaboration with the Secretary of State are charged with promoting a framework for responsible behavior in outer space uh, that includes the international adoption of U.S. space regulatory practices, interoperability among space systems, services, and data, and facilitating new market opportunities for United States commercial space capabilities and services. Uh, the national space policy also calls for cooperation with like-minded international partners to establish standards of safe and responsible behavior, including openness, transparency, and predictability uh, to, to facilitate the detection, identification, and attribution of actions in space that are inconsistent with the safety, stability, security, and long-term sustainability of space activities. So to implement that policy, let me just quickly mention uh, a few of the actions we are engaged in related to responsible behavior in outer space. I will start and then I will turn this over uh, to Gabriel. So let me just mention uh, the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with as an important mechanism for promoting responsible behavior. Uh, UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or we call UN COPUIS, 
is the preeminent international forum for advancing the peaceful exploration and use of outer space. Since its inception in 1958, COPUS has promoted international cooperation in space activities and has fostered information exchange among developed and developing countries on the latest advances in space exploration and applications and their beneficial results for humanity. Uh, for the United States, COPUS provides the opportunity to share US standards and best practices with the committee's member states to encourage the responsible use of outer space. Uh, the 2019 adoption of the 21 long-term sustainability guidelines by COPUS, uh, which were heavily influenced by US practices, establishes a widely accepted international framework that focuses on ensuring a sustainable outer space environment that is accessible uh, to future generations. And uh, we are committed to the safe, sustainable, and economically viable use of outer space. And we will continue using COPUS as a forum uh, to promote uh, these ideals. Uh, let me uh, hand it over now to, to Gabriel uh, to talk about another uh, effort, which has already been mentioned this morning, the Artemis Accords. Gabriel. Thanks, Dave. Um, and thanks to Acting Administrator Jersik as well for the very unnecessarily kind words um, and for introducing the Artemis Accords to the team here. Um, yeah, so 2020 was one of the busiest years in international space law and legal policy uh, that we've seen for a long time. And, you know, the, the, the gateway agreements have already been mentioned, but I think the sort of highest level thing that we've done is the, um, is the Artemis Accords. And I know many of you are familiar with that, with the Accords already, and the acting administrator already um, described them quite well. So I'll just do a, a quick rundown. I think you all probably know that the Artemis Accords are, um, are not a treaty. They're not an international agreement. They're a political commitment among a group of our closest partners um, about some norms of behavior, or should we say rules and principles that will guide our, our activities as we explore the moon, Mars, and, and go beyond. You know, they were really prompted by the operational side of what NASA and, its inter and their international partners are doing on the Artemis program. As the Artemis program itself moves forward and we realize we're going to be doing new things, um, it means we have to answer questions that we, the international community in the United States, have never been forced to answer before, particularly as we have sustained operations, potentially in close proximity to other actors. So we felt we, the Department of State and NASA, came together and worked closely with the interagency to develop a, an agreed set of principles that could guide our own behavior as well as that of our partners. Um, and we felt like it was really important to have some sort of basic guidance to answer certain key questions that are going to be ar arising in these operations. Things like transparency of operations, deconfliction of activities, right? how do you operate in close proximity together, release of scientific data, preservation of outer space heritage, um, the use of space resources, and a number of other issues. So, you know, I think you all know, uh, but I want to emphasize the Accords are uh, about civil space activities, right? They really are about the, the civil side of what we and our partners do. So they're not directly applicable to either the security side activities that governments might engage in or to the, to the private sector, sort of pure commercial operations as well. That said, these are principles and rules that we think are useful, and we definitely are hoping to um, get additional signatories and additional partners, um, as you heard um, from the acting administrator, to, to sign up to the accords. And we're also very keen to get um, feedback from you, from the private sector, um, on the principles that are set out in the accords to get some ideas about how you know, some of these principles might either apply or be modified or might be useful as you yourselves and your other commercial partners go on to do increasingly new and complicated activities in outer space. Um, so that's the Artemis Accords. There's always more we could talk about there and maybe you'll have some questions. I did just wanna also mention the question of space resources and in particular what's going on internationally this year on space resources. Um, it's been a, an active year um, on the US side uh, in the past year. Or so we of course had our executive order, the Artemis Accords and then NASA's um, uh, purchase of space lunar resources as well. Um, but in terms of the international side, space resources are probably going to be the, 
a main topic at the legal subcommittee of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Um, that's going to be happening the first week and a half or so of June this year. We'll see what the format's going to be because of COVID. But either way, it looks like the, the priority for the legal subcommittee will be the establishment of a working group to look at space resource questions. Um, and this is where you come in, where the members of Comstack and, and the broader community come in. Um, I think our task is going to be trying to decide what a good focus for that working group is, right? What a, what a, a rational work plan would look like, what a rational product would be, um, something that we could point the international community to that would actually, you know, make some, make some helpful progress in terms of space resources without taking on, you know, more, that they, more than they could chew or, you know, sort of a broad undefined mandate. So if there's particular questions on space resources that you think would be useful, to have some international focus on, but we are, we're very much all ears. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Dave to talk about registration. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, very quickly, um, while the US has consistently shared its uh, public satellite catalog through its space situational awareness efforts, um, there has been some criticism of U.S. practice uh, regarding the registration convention and making space object filings uh, timely uh, and accurately with the United Nations. Um, so uh, let me just say that to ensure a more consistent process, um, the, U the U.S. Uh, National Space Traffic Management Policy, which was issued in June 2018, directed the Department of State to lead efforts to streamline the U.S. government's interagency process uh, to ensure accurate and timely space object registration submissions. Uh, the streamlined process was completed in early 2019 and fully implemented across the U.S. government in early 2020 uh, in cooperation with our partners, uh, such as the FAA and NASA. And as a result, uh, the frequency and timeliness of U.S. registration filings has significantly improved for spacecraft launched in the second half of 2020. And uh, we have cleared over a year's worth of backlogged reports uh, to date. So uh, we will continue to look for areas of improvement in this process and uh, greatly appreciate the help of our interagency partners uh, and of course of uh, our commercial industry as well uh, in improving our US registration filings. Um, I think I'm going to stop there, uh, see if you have any questions, and say that uh, both uh, Gabriel and I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Gabe, um, for your time this morning, kind of mapping out what the you know, U.S. intends to do globally to develop these norms. Anyone else uh, on the membership, anyone have a question? For either of them. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, hi, Dave. Uh, Gabriel, Jim, Jim Armour. Uh, good to see you guys and thanks for all your, your work here. Just um, sort of a general question on how it's going with the norms of responsible behavior your discussions. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, if FAA AST is a part of those conversations um, internationally? Are they a team member that regularly goes with you to Copuus? Um, and have they talked about uh, launch from the moon uh, as part of the norms of behavior and standards that you discussed? Thanks. Jim, thank you very much for that uh, question. <laughs> Good to see you as well. Uh, I, I'll, I'll turn to Gabriel in a minute here, um, and perhaps we need to turn to, to AST, um, but I will just say that, yes, uh, this is a whole of government activity, our pursuit of norms of uh, responsible behavior uh, on the civil side, and it, that obviously includes uh, our commercial industry, and uh, it includes the security side as well. Um, but our focus is on civil and commercial and uh, the FAA and AST are absolutely part of that process. And when appropriate, they absolutely join us on delegations and discussions with either individual nations or groups of nations. Um, so let me, let me stop there. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we have had any discussions yet about specifically launch from the moon 
Um, so let me let me see if uh, if anyone else feels qualified to answer that question. So I don't feel qualified. I don't feel qualified, Dave. Yeah, no, it, it's I, I appreciate the question. It's one that law students like to ask me as well as sort of a gotcha because it's a um, you know one of those questions we don't have an answer to yet. I think the the short answer is that for these kinds of novel questions, we're gonna with the, at the moment we're working through them on a case by case basis. Um, just as we do when we have some complex um, cross-border operations as well here terrestrially. Um, I do think launching objects from the surface of the moon or from other celestial bodies is a, is a question we, the international community and the U.S. government are going to have to address in the relatively near term and how we handle that, particularly when we start getting into objects that have themselves been manufactured in space. Um, I think what the answer for those kinds of questions will be is, is to be determined. And if there's a particular direction of where that answer should go, that's, you know, that's, it's another one of those things where I think we'd love to hear. We'd love to hear from industry on what a workable solution for in-space launches would look like. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Gabe. A lot of really great legal <laughs> work to be done in the future, I see. I uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, I'd like to hand it back uh, to Jim Hatt for the for the administrator, FAA administrator. You're muted, Jim. Thank you, Dave and Dave. Uh, there have been a couple questions from the public, uh, but we need to move on to the FAA administrator. So what I'll do is I will send those couple questions Jim? to you. Yeah. Uh, it's a little hard to hear you. Um, Let, you. Let's try this. There we go. Thanks. There we go. All right. Let, let me start again. I apologize, everybody. Uh, like I said at the beginning, technology doesn't always work like we wish it would. Uh, but Gabe and Dave Turner, uh, thank you for uh, your remarks. Great, great uh, information. Uh, we do have some questions from the public, which, uh, if you don't mind, I will send them to you, and then we can put the questions and answers up on our website, uh, because we need to move on to the FAA administrator. But again, thank you for your comments. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce the Deputy Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation, uh, Mr. Kelvin Coleman, uh, who will introduce the FAA administrator. Kelvin, over to you. Thank you, Jim, and uh, good morning, Comstack members. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Mr. Steve Dixon, the FAA Administrator. Mr. Dixon began his five-year term as FAA Administrator in July of 2019. Prior to joining the FAA, Mr. Dixon served as Senior Vice President of Flight Operations for Delta Airlines, where he was responsible for the safety and operational performance of Delta's global flight operations, as well as pilot training, crew resources, crew scheduling, and regulatory compliance. Mr. Dixon is a former United States Air Force officer and F-15 fighter pilot, and he's a, a distinguished graduate of the class of 1979 at the United States Air Force Academy, as well as a graduate of the Georgia State University College of Law. And if I might add, a very dear friend of commercial space transportation and an honorary space cadet. Uh, so with that, over to you, Mr. Dixon. Thanks, Kelvin. And uh, it's, it's great to be with uh, such a, an august group of uh, leaders, not only in U.S. commercial space uh, and space in, in general, but also uh, global uh, leaders as well. So it's a pleasure to be here for today's Comstack meeting. Uh, a number of familiar names uh, on, the, on the Zoom here. Uh, hopefully this will be uh, the last uh, time we'll have to do this completely virtually. We'll keep our fingers crossed on that, but hopefully by the time we get uh, into the late summer and fall, uh, we can uh, be back uh, together and, uh, and actually have this dialogue uh, in person. Uh, I wanna thank uh, uh, Secretary Buttigieg uh, for his support of Comstack. He could not be here today. Uh, also, uh, thank you to uh, Charity and Karina for your outstanding leadership and dedication uh, to this advisory committee that does uh, such important work on behalf of the, uh, of the commercial space sector uh, and the FAA 
and uh, and all of our uh, space commercial space stakeholders. You know, really, if you think about it, now is the time for us to build on our current successes uh, to continue to build a strong foundation for the future of commercial space. And I've got both the confidence and certainly the strong expectation that this is the group uh, that will help all of us get it right. You know, it's been a very confident, uh, consequential six months since the last uh, ComStack meeting. We have a new president, uh, we have a new uh, secretary, and even in the middle of a global pandemic, we have a commercial space tempo that not only is not uh, letting up, but it's uh, ramping up considerably. And that, that tempo and that launch cadence uh, continues to increase. In fact, we're on track to have a record year uh, with about uh, one commercial launch or re-entry uh, every week uh, in the neighborhood of about 50 this year is what it's looking like. So, you know, we're all excited uh, about uh, all of these developments, all these novel questions that, that we're dealing with. Uh, and I'm humbled and honored that the FA has a growing role uh, in commercial space. Um, but I'm also enthusiastic that we as a, as a society can use this energy to cultivate an aerospace passion in a new generation of, uh, of children and young people, uh, the way that the Apollo program did for so many of us uh, back in the days. In many ways, this is the most exciting uh, period in aerospace that we have seen in decades, if not ever. Uh, and if you think about all the energy in commercial space right now, and you look at what NASA has been able to do lately, and uh, kudos to Steve Jerzyk and the whole NASA team for the Mars 2020 success. I had the privilege of attending the launch uh, back in July, and I'm checking out the, uh, the images from Mars uh, daily uh, to see the, the wonderful uh, uh, images and the progress of perseverance and really excited to see that upcoming Wright Brothers moment with the Ingenuity uh, helicopter here, hopefully uh, within the next few weeks. So we're at the right place uh, at the right time, really to spur uh, young people to pursue, uh, to pursue uh, space careers and aerospace careers. But we've got to do it right. You know, success can be fragile in this business and it doesn't take much uh, to have a setback or, or a, uh, a reversal in course. So you know where, I, where I'm going with this and that's about safety. You know, we've got to do it right, um, make safety our North, North Star. The FAA is responsible for uh, protecting public safety for commercial space. We all know that. And it sounds like common sense, but I also know that we can, we, uh, you know, it's easy uh, to lose sight of that when there's uh, a lot of great work going on to facilitate uh, progress. But, you know, some solemn anniversaries can remind us of what can happen when we don't get it right. Uh, every January 28th, many Americans remember where they were and what they were doing when we lost the Challenger crew in 1986. For myself, I was at Langley Air Force Base uh, at a junior officers uh, conference with the command, uh, commander in chief of Tactical Air Command. Um, and it would be 975 days, nearly three years before another space shuttle uh, took flight. Uh, when we do get it right, uh, sometimes there are some tough calls that have to be made. Um, early in 1961, when America wanted very much for Alan Shepard uh, to be the first in space, there was a great deal of pressure uh, to go. And uh, Werner von Braun, who was heading up the manned space program, insisted that launch, NASA launch one more uncrewed flight uh, to work out issues uh, from the previous launch. And as a result of that extra flight, uh, America was on the sidelines as uh, Yuri Gagarin entered the record books on April 12th. Now, Shepard, of course, made it into space safely only three weeks later and had an illustrious uh, astronaut uh, and space career of his own. But Von Braun took a lot of heat for that decision. But, uh, you know, America did put the first, uh, become the first nation, as we all know, to put humans on the moon a few short years later. And of course, Alan Shepard himself left footprints on the lunar surface in 1971. So sometimes uh, you have to go slow, keep everybody in formation to go fast. And that's, that's what we're gonna be doing. Now, of course, we can't take all the dangers out of commercial space transportation. 
but I also know that we have to make it as safe as humanly possible. And sometimes that means if I can use an aviation term here, we've got to set the parking brake and make sure that we're, uh, we're all aligned, take the time to figure out the best way forward. It also means that uh, sometimes there are some tough decisions uh, to be made. Now, when mishaps do happen, which is not uncommon in a fast moving new field, they should be successful failures, uh, meaning that the failure was consistent with, uh, in this case, the FAA's analysis that showed that the public would be kept, uh, kept safe. So far, there have been six mishaps this uh, fiscal year, some that ended in spectacular fireballs that went viral on social media, but all six of these were successful failures because we were able to protect uh, public safety. But I'll also say that safety requires constant nurturing, um, evolution and improvement. What we do to ensure uh, safety today won't be good enough for tomorrow. Um, all of us, including the FAA, have to innovate or we risk being left behind. However, I, it's, this is really not a binary choice between innovation and safety. We need to push both concurrently and that's exactly what, uh, what the agency is doing. Uh, for example, two days ago, the uh, SLR2 rule uh, went live, and I'm very proud of the government and industry collaboration that made this possible. The new rule takes us into the future when one license can now support multiple launches and reentries at multiple locations. That's game changing innovation and, and great progress uh, from where we have been uh, up to this point. And this is really a, uh, a trailblazer, if you think about it, for future efforts to make common sense performance-based regulations that add real value for our stakeholders and ultimately for the American people. And speaking of collaboration, uh, I'm also encouraged that the FAA adopted many of the safety working group recommendations from the September meeting. And that includes how we can implement a voluntary incident reporting database for the commercial space transportation industry. And you know, one, I think one of the key components to a safety program is having a robust incident reporting program. So I really applaud that uh, breakthrough. These kinds of programs have been extremely valuable in making commercial aviation transportation uh, the safest uh, form of, of transportation. So I look forward to hearing about your progress on the many important topics that you'll tackle today. As always, the FAA is, is here to help. Uh, my door is always open when it comes to talking about safety and how we can move a commercial space forward. And uh, before we leave, or before I leave, I'd like to uh, give you a plug for the FAA's podcast called The Air Up There. Um, done a, several of these now. Recently, uh, we released an episode about the FAA's role in commercial space safety and the steps that we're taking with the air traffic organization uh, to support safety and integrate uh, space launches and reentries uh, uh, in a more uh, systemic way into our daily air traffic operations as we move forward. And we interview, even interviewed uh, Wayne Monteith uh, for this. So uh, if you get a chance, please check it out. So again, thank you for your leadership, uh, for your dedication and everything you're doing uh, for our country and, uh, and the great uh, work that you're doing uh, to help, uh, help the agency uh, and all of commercial space uh, move forward. And thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you, sir. I uh, greatly appreciate your comments and your leadership uh, here within the FAA and your support of AST and Comstack. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and yes, for 50 went live. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. I think that is going to be a great step forward for commercial space transportation industry as a whole. All right, next, um, I'd like to just take a few moments and uh, bring up some AST people to speak about some of the updates that have happened in AST since the last Comstack meeting to include just a brief discussion of part 450. So I'll ask, uh, Acting Executive Director uh, Randy Repchek uh, to speak about uh, the the rule and some dates and some things. Uh, Steph Earl, who is the Assistant 
uh, division manager for strategic management uh, and or policy and innovation, sorry. And then uh, Pam Underwood, who is the director of the Office of Spaceports to give a little bit of an update on spaceports and where we are with, with that and international. So first, Randy, over to you if you're available, sir. Oops, there I am, sorry. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, as was mentioned, the, the, the streamlined launch and reentry licensing requirements final rule is uh, now in effect. It became on effect on March 21st, last Sunday. Uh, it was delayed of, uh, about a week and a half uh, because the new, administrat uh, the, the new administration wanted to review rules that were published in the Federal Register but weren't yet effective. Uh, and so uh, that review is now complete and the rule is now effective. Now, that the, that delay did not change the other two important dates with the rule. Uh, the first important date is uh, June 8th, uh, 2021. And that is the last date that companies can apply for a license under the legacy requirements, uh, part 431 and part 417. So anybody that um, has a, an accepted application on that date can apply under those legacy requirements. Uh, after that date, uh, any new application has to be under part 450. Uh, and the other important date is on March 10th, uh, 2026 will be less than five years from now. Uh, uh, the old regulations will go away. And so anybody that has a current license under Part 431 and 417 uh, will have to move over to Part 450. But there was a, um, a generous five-year grace period there. So um, so that's pretty much the dates there. Uh, I'll give it over to Steph Furrow to talk about the, uh, the great deal of work we're doing on advisory circulars. Thanks, Randy. So on advisory circulars, AST, Team AST is working on 29 advisory circulars that accompany part 450. So far, we have completed three of them and posted them on our website. And you'll find that every advisory circular that we post on the website ends with a comment feedback form where operators and uh, anyone reviewing the advisory circular can provide feedback to the AST. So we will be able to update that again. And we've made a commitment to look at all the comments within 30 days of a published advisory circular and gives you kind of a way of looking at the advisory circular very similar to the way we produce a notice of uh, proposed rulemaking. So it's not exactly the same process, but it does offer everyone an opportunity to see an advisory circular, make comments on the advisory circular, and we've committed to within 30 days trying to turn those comments and then produce a second advisory circular updated advisory circular. As I mentioned, or as the slide shows, our goal is six by the end of April. And so we're, we're working pretty hard. We put three out already, uh, high fidelity flight safety analysis, high consequence event protection, and computing system software are already on the AST website. Anyone can go there and look at it. And as I mentioned, the end of that will have your comment feedback form. The next three that we're hoping to get out by the end of April, as the flight abort rule development and the hazard control st strategy determination, as well as safety critical systems advisory circulars. The overall goal is to produce all of this advisory circular documentation and have it out on the street by the end of calendar year 21. And it's, it's a large task. We're working in parallel on a number of advisory circulars. So if we can beat that tape, that'd be great. We will work our, our hardest to make sure we get all of the advisory circular guidance out reviewed and then reissued as soon as possible. Uh, and the slide already ha has the website where you can go to to view the advisory circulars that we've already published. All right, thank you, Steph. And over to Pam Underwood, the Director of Space Office of Spaceports. Pam? All right, good morning, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with the Comstack this morning about the Office of Spaceports. There are several big topics that the, that the Comstack is working on relative to spaceports, such as the Na National Spaceport Strategy, among other things. And I look forward to hearing updates on those uh, this afternoon in today's program. The Office of Spaceports definitely looks forward to working with uh, the Comstack in these areas in the future. 
One thing that we're trying to do in the Office of Spaceports to ensure success of these types of initiatives is we think it's important to bring forward activities that will put spaceports part of the regular dialogue in the future of the commercial space transportation industry. Today, we talk a lot about launch vehicles and innovations and advances in launch vehicles and payloads and even planetary exploration. What we don't talk a lot about openly in this discussion is spaceports. The Office of Spaceports is committed to changing this. I believe everyone has seen the spaceports map that's shown on the screen. It's been out there and it does a great job of showing the location of all of the FAA licensed spaceports, private spaceports, and federal launch sites that support the commercial space transportation industry. What we've done now in the Office of Spaceports, if we can go to the next slide, please, is we've expanded information to have a spaceports by state searchable area on our website. This, of course, just shows Colorado, but it, the type of information is available is very keen. This is also available for every state shown on the previous map. This is, consider this the start of a spaceport facility directory that will document all US domestic spaceports. Very similar in nature to what the uh, aviation industry has in their airport facility directories and has been in use for many years. I wanna thank all the spaceports that provided the information contained on each one of these sections. And I look forward to working with them in the future because this information I'd like to keep from getting stale. I want it to be updated as things change or even as new spaceports emerge. But it's important that we have this type of information. It characterizes the existing US launch and reentry infrastructure and capabilities that we have. We're very fortunate in the United States to have this type of infrastructure. And I think that having this type of collective information, again, brings that information forward and documents where we are currently leading to where we should be in the future as part of bringing it into the regular dialogue. Um, about the future of the commercial space transportation industry. As I mentioned, this documents all the US domestic spaceports. The Office of Spaceports is also uh, working very closely with many international governments that are interested in developing launch sites and space regulatory information from their countries. We, we want to, in the Office of Spaceports, build strong strategic partnerships with international governments for these spaceport developments or for the effort of commercial space transportation regulatory approaches. These types of strategic international partnerships supports the growth of this growing global commercial space transportation industry. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to update um, Comstack this morning. And I believe the next up, Jim, is Charity Whedon. All right, thank you, Pam. Uh, yes, and before we do, for any of the panelists, uh, if you have any questions for Steph or Randy or Pam, uh, please go ahead and unmute and ask. I'll give you just a moment here. Sounds like we're all good, Jim. All right. I agree. I didn't hear any questions. Um, so great job, Randy, Steph, and Pam. Normally if I talk, there's always questions. So obviously you, you covered your topics very well. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, so next up, I'd like to uh, more formally introduce Charity Whedon uh, as the chair of Comstack. Uh, she's the vice president of global space policy at Astroscale. Uh, and then following her, Karina Dries, the vice chair of Comstack, who is, and this is a, a recent change, so congratulations to her, President of Commercial Space Flight Federation. Uh, so Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair, uh, over to you for opening remarks on this great ComStack day. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I, I know he couldn't join us today, but a warm welcome to Secretary Bedjedge, and I hope he gets to join us next meeting. Um, I also want to let them know that many here today grew up wanting to be astronauts, so you are in good company. To Administrator Dixon, Acting Administrator Drusik, Deputy Administrator Mims, Dave Turner, and Gabrielle Swinney, 
Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak with us. And to the FAA AST team, General Monteith, once again, your team deserves a medal for their tireless work facilitating and regulating commercial space transportation for the United States. And of course, to Jim Hadd and J uh, Tom Murata for their constant support in helping to ensure us members are adhering to the charter for this longstanding uh, advisory committee. To my fellow members, thank you for continuing to be active and engaged in this advisory committee, despite COVID barriers and busy schedules. Um, it is the energy and expertise of Comstack members who help provide insights in creating a strong commercial space transportation future. In this vein, we honor and remember Senator David Carnes, who served on Comstack since 2018. As part of the regulatory working group, his advice was sought and respected, bringing his unique experiences and understanding of the legislative crossover to commercial space flight activities. We recognize and thank him for his service. This is a good time to reflect on the past year of which covers this cohort of Comstack membership as we enter the 38th year of Comstack itself. And what a year it's been. We have yet to meet in person, <laughs> uh, but we have also managed to come together to think through and provide advice on critical issues for the FAA. We've been trusted to provide feedback on nine topics so far, six of which we will vote to send up today. The continued request for inputs, as we will see later today, are not only a sign of the pace of innovation occurring, but also that AST is proactively looking to this industry to identify as many ways as possible to smooth the pathway for a successful and uh, safe commercial space transportation. Now, this pace of launch and reentry, orbital operations, even exploration, can be characterized by the term acceleration. And it is clear, while it has been difficult, this industry has not been deterred by a global pandemic. Private human spaceflight operations from US soil now exist. Constellations of hundreds to a thousand satellites exist with more to come. Commercial satellite servicing missions exist. Pre-pandemic, this was not the case. AST has been doing its best to keep pace. But even my seventh grader who is taking algebra from home knows that an exponential function will overtake a linear one at some point. So the question at hand is not if, but when will current resources struggle to keep pace with commercial space transportation efforts here in the US. I don't assume to know the answer here, but I see this membership as a bank of knowledge to ponder such issues and present solutions. One such effort that intends to support this accelerated US launch and reentry activity is the streamlined regulation, which was mentioned earlier. And it came into effect this past Sunday. The efforts don't end there though. Improvements will be needed for continue, continuously, whether they be advisory circulars for the updated regulation, resource adjustments, or consistent communication between regulator and applicant to ensure speed of licensing and safety. So while I've reflected on this absolutely successful year in commercial space transportation, I wanna hand it over to Karina to get her perspective on a future outlook and to run through procedurally our discussion and decisions today. Karina, over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Charity. Uh, I will just very briefly um, echo Charity's comments about um, all of the hard work that everyone has been doing, and especially the uh, Wayne, Kelvin, Jim, Tom, all of your, your folks at AST have uh, been putting in uh, a lot of extra time in support of the industry, and we, we notice it, we really appreciate it. Charity, thank you so much for your leadership of Comstack um, and all the Comstack members, you know, considering um, the cadence has not uh, decreased. You all have day jobs. We so appreciate all of the time that you're putting into this effort. 
Um, as Charity mentioned, just a couple of notes on you know what we're what we're expecting for the future. And as FAA Administrator Dixon highlighted, we have seen incredible growth in the commercial space transportation industry. The launch cadence has more than tripled in the past five years, and it is expected the demand for launch and therefore reentry will increase steadily due to the increased demand for both government and commercial products in space. Uh, many of these were mentioned by Acting NASA Administrator Steve Jerzyk this morning, with additional focus on human-tended research, national lab research opportunities, in-space manufacturing, and private space stations. Commercial space transportation will place additional demands on AST. One of the issues that we're going to be discussing over the next few years is human spaceflight occupant safety. We already know that Congress in the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015 directed AST to promote the development of industry consensus. And last September, Comstack endorsed the work AST is doing in concert with ASTM's F47 group on this topic. Standards are usually developed once, to, once an industry reaches a more stable period of innovation. Part of the challenge today is that the same people with the technical competence to produce standards based on the state of the art are actually reinventing the state of the art. But one thing the government can do is invest resources to make it easier for industry to set aside some brain power to help write these standards. Industry is determined to continue with its successful track record with respect to, to safety, which is another topic that FAA Administrator Dixon highlighted this morning. We can help AST promote occupant safety by making sure AST has the extra resources it needs to develop expertise in human spaceflight, not from the shuttle era, but from Dragon and Starliner, New Shepard and Spaceship Two. AST should be able to put should be able to place some staff um, out in the industry where they can learn about the new design concepts, component technologies, and operating practices used in the new human spaceflight vehicles being developed today and tomorrow. Likewise, we can pursue other means of training AST personnel and how industry is trying to design safety into their systems and related state-of-the-art information so that AST has the expertise to promote occupant safety across the industry for both current and future generations of service providers. All of this means more people at AST and more dollars on creating learning projects so that AST can grow to understand human spaceflight before it starts to aggressively regulate it. Another topic that is facing space users is orbital debris. Comstack members received a briefing from AST staff about a potential future rulemaking that could utilize the collision on launch analysis to try to minimize the creation of space debris. Now there isn't a single person on Comstack who isn't committed to sustainability in our use of earth orbital space, which includes avoiding creation of space debris. The dramatic improvement on how the federal government notifies civilian, commercial, and international space users of potential collisions and support for innovative technologies that can help clean up orbital space. There is also some discussion of the legal foundation for this regulatory approach, which we aren't going to resolve immediately. But I do think that industry should engage with AST on this topic. I don't know that Comstack is the best form for doing that, but I believe the right mechanism for doing so is with an aerospace rulemaking committee or a SPARC. And I also would like to propose that AST name our Comstack chairperson as one of the industry co-leaders of such a rulemaking committee. I'd like to uh, hand it off to Shanna Dale of the Regulatory Working Group very shortly, but first uh, we want to prepare the Comstack members for expectations today. The Regulatory Working Group and the Innovation and Infrastructure Working Group will each have three items to present for a vote. We will plan to call for a vote on each item separately. The safety working group will not have items for a vote during the meeting, but will provide an update following the INI presentation and vote. I'd like to introduce Shanna Dale, chair of the regulatory working group, to discuss the several taskers they have been working on. Shanna? Thank you, Karina and Charity, as well as Wayne, Kelvin, and Jim at AST. Um, I am actually going to, to turn over the discussion and presentation of the three tasks of the regulatory working group over to my co-chair, Clay Morey, uh, a vice president at Blue Origin. Uh, I wanna thank 
the members of the regulatory working group for doing an excellent job with the tasks that were before us and preparing some really good recommendations. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Clay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shanna. Uh, so the uh, regulatory working group that I co-chair with Shanna uh, has been busy at work on a number of uh, taskers that have been handed down. Uh, and let me just walk through those for you today. Um, our first one um, before the group was to prioritize future rulemakings. Uh, so we, uh, this came from out of the June Comstack meeting um, and uh, we've created a, a priority list uh, back for, um, for the uh, FAA. Next slide, please. Um, and, uh, and let me just, uh, so on this task one, the recommendation here uh, is to, uh, to prioritize uh, uh, part 450 uh, uh, and uh, that includes preserving resources for the development of advisory circulars and other uh, needed refinements. We think that is the, the number one uh, priority uh, that's going to uh, help uh, for industry and, and we move forward on streamlining regulations. Uh, followed by that would be work on uh, part 440 uh, and then on parts 420 uh, slash uh, 433. So this is uh, uh, what we think in terms of uh, priorities and goals on regulatory streamlining uh, for the FAA. Next slide, please. Our, uh, our second tasker uh, was working on defining what's called a complete enough or a complete application under part 413.13. Uh, I'd like to, to thank um, uh, uh, the, the folks that worked uh, on this, including Ann Zakulski, uh, uh, who did a, quite a bit of work to, to uh, come up with um, the recommendations that we provided here. And there were five major recommendations uh, that came uh, out of this effort uh, on defining what's considered a, a complete enough application uh, in, a, in a typical loss, license permitting application process, trying to get to a place where uh, this would be much more streamlined uh, and uh, provide much clearer direction to applicants uh, who are applying to the FAA for launch licensing. Uh, next slide. So uh, as I said, there were a number of uh, recommendations that came out of those, the first of which was uh, creating specific deadlines uh, for the evaluation in the pre-application consultation phase, uh, including a formal uh, initiation of the pre-application process uh, where the FAA could acknowledge that in writing uh, that and providing a clear time frame uh, for what to expect as they move through that evaluation phase. Uh, and then moving uh, from there, uh, once that application consultation has been concluded, uh, the FAA would acknowledge uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the applicant, uh, license applicant is under a complete enough review uh, and its initial review is complete enough uh, within two weeks. Uh, so trying to provide some clear uh, definable timeframes for this uh, and that they would provide written feedback within 30 days to the applicant. Next slide. Uh, after the review, the FAA would provide the applicant with uh, a determination that was complete enough as required under 413.11b uh, uh, and, and do that in writing to the applicant and, and let them know if they're missing any content or need uh, clarifications, trying to get a checklist here that would uh, be helpful to industry applicants. Uh, I should say, particularly for those who've never applied for a license before, this is a, a huge, uh, huge help for, for companies that are trying to work through the um, application process. Uh, and then uh, following on to that, uh, providing those applicants with a reasonable deadline uh, for responding to the concerns outlined. Uh, and once the issues are identified uh, uh, and have been addressed in writing, the FAA should provide um, the applicant with acknowledgement in writing uh, that the application is in fact complete enough uh, under 413.11a. Next slide, please. Uh, the recommendation number two, and as I said, there's five of these uh, recommendations. Uh, this is to provide uh, an advisory circular um, uh, that uh, the applicant must meet uh, complete enough to move out of that pre-application consultation phase uh, and working uh, 
uh, we, we're recommending that the FAA would work with industry to develop uh, appropriate content for this advisory circular. Um, so uh, you can read down here. I won't go through all of the elements of this, but uh, you know, working through safety uh, critical uh, system descriptions, uh, emergency procedures, uh, hazardous materials list, and and so on, uh, so that uh, um, the applicants uh, are aware of, of what those uh, elements are. Next slide. Uh, and then here is the is the ability of the FAA to request uh, additional information from the applicant during the uh, evaluation, uh, but that it should be limited only to information that was not covered uh, under the uh, uh, under the AC. And this is important uh, not to get caught in a um, let's say a, a, a loop where uh, it's continuing just seeking more information uh, here that uh, that we're trying to get to a system that's uh, clearly defined uh, and navigable by by the applicants. So. Next slide, please. On recommendation three, uh, uncomplete enough, uh, we're uh, recommending that a determination letter should be uh, uh, include a notification that the statutory 100 day, 180 day or 120 day review required is started uh, as, as of the day the application was submitted uh, and not, not from the time that it was deemed complete enough, trying to again uh, streamline and, and, uh, and create uh, um, a more knowable timeline. Uh, and we want the evaluation of each of the following areas to include, you know, flight safety, system safety, environmental compliance, ground safety, payload review, and policy for review. And if you want to see more about this, please check the, uh, the white paper that's related to this uh, on the website. You can see that it's uh, uh, listed there below. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the fourth recommendation uh, was that throughout this uh, entire uh, evaluation phase, they should be uh, the FAA should be updating the applicant on their status uh, periodically, making sure they, they know where they are and, and uh, what tasks they have ahead of them. Uh, and then in the event that the FAA believes the review period must be told uh, as outlined regulations, they should provide uh, the applicant uh, on the day they begin that toll, uh, a letter that outlines the deficiencies in their application. And so they know uh, what work that they have to do moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, here on uh, recommendation number five on accuracy, uh, uh, we're recommending uh, that the FAA eliminate the pre-application consultation for licenses with active licenses that are in process uh, of being updated for accuracy upon certification by the licensee, that there's no technical modifications to launch vehicles. So this, again, to streamline the regulation. Okay, uh, moving on. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, here on recommendation five, to the maximum extent practical, um, uh, when evaluating the license, uh, the FAA should utilize existing environmental impact uh, assessment data, uh, uh, existing flight ground and system safety data, uh, everything that uh, can be uh, gleaned from that. Um, uh, and adding existing information with the previous policy and payload reviews for the applicants uh, with uh, active licenses uh, or permit. Next slide, please. Um, and here on task number three, this is uh, on international dual licensing. So uh, I would like to uh, thank Mike French for all his efforts here on pulling together uh, the work uh, and, and reviewing this uh, for the group. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so um, this is uh, for uh, U.S. Uh, uh, launches uh, and reentries outside of the United States, uh, trying to make sure that we eliminate um, any duplication in the burden uh, to U.S. industry uh, if they're operating a system uh, uh, that uh, from outside the U.S. borders, but that would be licensed uh, by the FAA. The, the, the delivery uh, deliverable here will include ways to reduce um, uh, FAA AST's costs, such as travel and staff time for on-site inspection. Uh, and uh, we think that the literal should be in the form of a narrative uh, report. Next slide, please. So uh, when we look through the recommendations here, uh, we are recommending that uh, the FAA uh, adopt the following processes and, uh, or practices that benefit this dual licensing process. Uh, we think you know, first that earlier in-depth government-to-government uh, activity by the FAA, AST, and the Department of State uh, during the pre-application process, pre-excuse me, pre-pre-application process, 
uh, uh, looking at uh, mutually recognizable agreements, uh, MOU processes, uh, making sure regulatory templates and cross waiver uh, education support is uh, in place and allow those, uh, uh, those MOUs and agreements uh, uh, to be utilized. Next slide. Uh, we endorse uh, uh, the use of FAA's uh, risk-based assessments of, uh, that are required for uh, on-site inspections at non-U.S. launches, uh, including industry uh, in government-to-government meetings where that's practicable uh, and allowed, uh, and uh, operating in a leader-follower model with other uh, U.S. government uh, entities. Next slide, please. Um, we think there's further study needed uh, to determine whether the following will benefit this dual licensing process, uh, looking at uh, any uh, lessons learned from the aviation uh, side of the house for FAA, um, looking at the potential for multi-site uh, environmental assessments, um, uh, reviewing if there's needed a statutory change to the definition of a U.S. citizen, and uh, statutory or executive order changes on the uh, applicability uh, of U.S. environmental regulations to non-U.S. jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Hey, Clay, I think that's the, the end of the RWG okay. slide deck. What I'd like to suggest here is a five minute break uh, for members that we can take this time bio break, but also review the, the three tasks and, and all the recommendations, kind of gather our thoughts for any questions or discussion before we vote. Would that be okay with you? Yes. Okay. Good, good recommendation, Great. sorry. I was trying to turn off the video to Consume yeah. bandwidth there, no limit consumption. No, no worries. Okay, so we'll reconvene uh, in five minutes, 11.08, um, and, and just ask everyone just to take a quick read through these, gather up any discussion or questions you might have, and then we will go through each and, and vote for them. All right, Very back good. in Thank five. You.
Hey, Claire, are you back on? Hi, Charity. Back. There we go. Okay, thanks. Back over to you. Okay, so um, happy to open this up to questions, comments. Um, um, we do have a, a couple of folks from uh, uh, the groups that worked on a number of these recommendations online as well, including Mike French and Anne, that I would invite to respond uh, if needed to any of the questions that come through. But maybe we could walk through uh, the, the, the three taskers, uh, and I'll start with the, uh, the prioritization one and ask if there are any any comments on our prioritization schedule, uh, starting with 450 and working down through um, the others? Any comments or questions regarding that priority uh, recommendation? Just Clay, just, just one quick thing, and uh, Charity, sorry for interrupting, but I wanted to mention uh, if the public has questions, they can type that into the Q&A section or send it to the email. Uh, that way we can start gathering them and provide those questions to you as well. Thank you, Jim. But, Appreciate it. But, and, and the ComStack panelists, please feel free to unmute. Uh, we would ask that you turn your video on uh, and ask questions and have a discussion on this. Thank you. Chris, you got a hand up? Yeah, real, yeah, real quickly. Um, since under the new rules, um, one license allows approval of, of a lot uh, from multiple locations, how is the applicant supposed to address the different environmental laws that occur in different states and different launch sites in, in the application process? That is not something that, that our group addressed in particular. Jim, I don't know if there's anyone from the FAA wants to, to at, uh, try to answer that question. My, 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 just to clarify my question, you know, it says, well, you know, they're supposed to address various things and one of them is yeah. environmental, but, but it is, yeah, but it isn't a uniform set of requirements. Not all states agree. You're absolutely yeah. right, Chris. And I know, you know, in the, on the West Coast of California, they've got certain things, environmental uh, uh, efforts there, um, protecting native species and other things that, that and, and other uh, local regulations that, uh, that do play a part there. Yeah, I can answer that question, I think. I mean, so even though under Part 450, um, we can, you know, license multiple lawn sites under one license. Yeah, it, it still might take multiple environmental reviews. Right, so different sites just might have different uh, NEPA requirements. So yeah, so that this um, the one license doesn't solve that particular problem. Okay, I, I think Chris, if you look at the recommendations, that's trying to use things that can be applied uh, across to different launch sites, but it, it certainly doesn't obviate the need for uh, for uh, complying with what a state by state, you know, differences in state regulatory structures for environmental. Yep. Yeah. Good answer. All right. Thank you. Charity? Just being orderly, putting my hand up. Um, <laughs> so for task one, it's clear that 450 is, you know, the most important here. Um, and, and that's going to an, be a continuous process. Do you or the others want to speak to the need and the resources here to walk and chew gum of doing both 450 440 and I see 420 is third. So that doesn't obviate the need to continue on spaceport um, um, regulation as well. So do you want to talk about the priorities and, and kind of the resource requirements that FAA might need to do all three? Yes, certainly. I think it's important from a, the regulatory working group's uh, position that um, you know that the FAA be properly resourced to be able to tackle these these huge tasks, and, and obviously the consolidation um, of all the different things into the 450 is going to is going to take a lot of, of time, effort, heavy lifting, um, and a number of resources from FAA AST, uh, and obviously from industry as well. Um, to, to try to um, work through this um, this new consolidated piece and, and put that in place. Um, so uh, 
but you're, you're right that um, 440 and 420 and uh, not losing the ball on, on spaceport regulations and, and where uh, we're trying to make other efforts, it's, it's important. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it open to Shanna and others on the committee about how we think uh, there, there needs to be the proper resourcing here, but, but clearly the priority to make sure that, that systems are getting licensed for launch is in under 450 is, is the number one piece and where we think we should, they should be focusing uh, the resources they have today. Shanna? I was just going to add real quickly that one of the concerns of the regulatory working group is that the experts at AST who would be involved in a new effort on streamlining part 440 and the other ones that come later, you might take them away from the part 450 work of developing advisory circulars, working separately with um, companies in terms of compliance with the new part 450. And so I think that, raises an issue in regards to staffing at AST and the need for additional resources for AST. This industry is only going to grow in terms of launches and re-entries. And so to the extent that it's going to benefit the United States and it's going to benefit industry in the U.S. to have more streamlining of the regulations that are on the books, are we adequately resourced? That's not a question right now for AST because that becomes rather tricky in regards to compliance and advocating for whatever the current budget request may be. But as an outsider and a member of Comstack, that's something that uh, I think we on the regulatory working group are very concerned about. Any other uh, members of the regulatory working group or ComStack members want to address the uh, resource issue? Clay, I see a, a few questions in the chat. I don't know if you would like us to moderate those or. Okay, so the one I see here is from Tim, Tim Wolf. Uh, earlier discussion on norms of behavior and preserving the space environment. Did regulatory working group consider in its prioritization of activities, any recommendations for rulemaking on orbital debris mitigation? We did not. Uh, I don't know if anyone, Chana or others want to address that. That was not part of the scope of what we, we, uh, we took on. We were really intent on looking at streamlining of existing regulations, and we have not gotten into the issue of rulemaking in regards to orbital debris, but that could be a topic for future discussion. Um, th there's one here as well about how do we think AST can facilitate industry to be resourced to support AST rulemaking. So, uh, so any recommendations on resources that industry needs, um, I guess in, in all the kind of the updated regulation, I, I, I find that the, um, the industry days have been helpful. Do you agree? And, and is there anything else here that AST can provide to us so that we can continue this conversation and expedite as well? Uh, I know we talked, we talked quite a bit about, um, in, particularly in the um, Complete Enough, about uh, the types of resources that uh, applicants would need to be able to go through the, the, the process. And, uh, I think there was a lot of concern over, in particular, for smaller companies um, that don't have a, a legal team or the kind of expertise and regulatory capability to be able to go through what can be a lengthy application process. And so a big part of our effort in trying to look for streamlining with this was uh, resource management. And we also asked, in particular, that um, the FAA may be able to provide a list of outside uh, um, consultants and lawyers and others that can help guide companies through uh, the pre-application and application process uh, to more effectively manage that if they don't have the internal deck, uh, expertise and the back and forth, the ability to go back and forth with those. Um, 
We've also talked about um, whether or not industry has enough resources or could collectively work. And I know Karina's looked a little bit at this of, of being able to join together on things like best practices uh, and, and standards um, that could be used uh, to the benefit of all to, 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 to be able to work with the FAA on that and establish those. Um, again, to try to reduce the burden uh, and the number of resources and duplication uh, in efforts uh, if we can if we could bring that to bear on the process. So Shanna, do you wanna add anything to that? Clay, I think you covered it well. The only other thing that I would add is my understanding AST was also having individual meetings with companies in regards to part 450 compliance. And um, I was really impressed with that effort. But I think going back to the point you made in regards to very small businesses, uh, ability to be pointed to experts that could help uh, probably would be very useful going into some of those meetings. Yeah, I think charity, particularly with the proliferation of, of uh, companies that are working on the smaller end of the launch business with, with uh, small vehicles uh, that have small teams, there's a lot of obviously a lot of interest and money flowing into that sector of the industry. These, these folks don't have huge uh, departments or, or, or groups internally that can, that can deal with that licensing burden uh, and, and the turn on the application process. And so trying to figure out how they can do that in a way that's efficient um, is, is huge. And, and we look forward to uh, uh, the FAA and AST's um, ability to maybe create, you know, folks that they've worked with in the past. It's not a recommendation of any way, in any way uh, to work with any particular consultant or or legal outfit, but just providing that set of resources that people could turn to uh, if they need it, if they don't have the internal resource. Eric, did you have a question there, concern? No, I, I lost my connection. I apologize. I'm back. Okay. I think Bill Beckman has a question. Bill, are you able to unmute and ask your question? Um, Bill, we can't hear you. It's all right. Can you hear me now? Now. Yep. Good. All yeah. right. Thank you very much. So uh, two questions. We have a, a 180 day or 120 day review period for submitting the application. Um, I would say that if the application is turned in in its entirety uh, at the start of that window, that's probably a valid, but I understand that there is, you can submit modules, kind of do a gradual submittal on that. So my question is, um, does this 180 day, 120 day window, is that a rolling window? Or once you submit the first part of your application that it triggers that, that timer clock? So, Wayne, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I can comment on that one, Bill. Uh, the the uh, uh, quote unquote clock begins uh, with the submittal of a complete application. And, and uh, the reason for that is uh, it would preclude, it would therefore preclude, uh, say, an applicant from, from submitting 10, 20, 50 percent of an application to get the clock started. Uh, and then the rest of it comes in, say, at day 170. Uh, and then there's an expectation that six months worth of work can be done in, in 10 days. However, during the pre-application process, that is one of those uh, areas that can be, uh, if you will, negotiated with the FAA. We're going to submit this part uh, with the expectation there'll be a, a time frame that, that will come back on that. Unfortunately, there are, there are some sections that are complicated enough that you can't just limit it to 10, 20, 30 days necessarily. Uh, but you know the, the way this is set up is so that we can work with the individual applicant to, to minimize that. And, and the goal is that 180 is the absolute far end uh, of the finish line. If we can finish earlier, that absolutely uh, benefits us uh, from a resource perspective uh, and benefits the, the applicant as well. But great question. Thank you, Wayne. 
Clay, there's um, a question here from General Ed Bolton. Ed, are you on? Would you like to ask it about the rollout timing? Uh, it was more a, a kind of a waxing philosophical than a question. I didn't necessarily want to put them on the spot with it. <laughs> talk, to them on, talk to them offline. Um, I was just curious. Uh, I, first of all, I, let me just uh, say this. I think this is a, a, a very solid body of work. And I think uh, uh, should uh, we be able to pull this off, should you be able to pull this off, I think it'll great, do a lot for uh, standardizing and simplifying uh, the work that you do. Uh, across our organizations. I, I guess I'll say parenthetically on the environmental issue, you can always consider uh, for each location uh, as you bring a, uh, as a fleet of vehicles come, comes on, do a one-time environmental assessment for that fleet of vehicles. And then, uh, you know, that, that, won't, that won't be as a, that w then wouldn't be as big a problem uh, for, uh, for multiple launches. But I was just, I was just curious, again, and you've talked about a little bit about the, uh, doing, figuring out the priority of this work, uh, turning into one integrated master schedule, uh, the rollout timeline and some of the workload issues that I think have been addressed since I, I wrote my question, a comment to charity in the break. So I don't have a, uh, any, any real question for you other than to say, I, I compliment you on your work and I wish you good luck in getting it all done in a timely fashion. Thank you very much. Charity, were there others you wanted to go into? Should we work through the other taskers in, in sequence or how'd you like to proceed? I, I feel our discussion has been going back and forth. Okay. <laughs> it kind of blended. Um, let's, let's pause here. If anyone has uh, from, from the ComSec management membership more discussion on either taskers one, two or three, perhaps we could start the voting process, at least for tasker one. Okay. All right, it sounds that um, there's no more discussion, at least for tasker one at this point. So um, I think Clay, do you wanna make an, a formal recommendation for tasker one? And Karina will take the role. So, you know, I guess under working under Robert Searle's order here, uh, uh, the regulatory working group uh, uh, recommends the comp stack for approval, uh, uh, the prioritization uh, recommendation that comes out of the group and um, submit that uh, uh, for, uh, for a vote before the comp stack. Excellent. Do we need a do we need a motion in a second or can we just call for the vote? I'll second if, okay. if you need one. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so what I will do, I'm going to call on everyone individually, and uh, I think I've got everyone sorted alphabetically by last name. So Jim Armour. Aye. Greg Aye. Okay. okay. Bill Beckman. Aye. Ed Bolton. Aye. Shanna Dale. Aye. Aye. Paul Dampus. Aye. Mary Lynn Dittmar. Aye. Mike French. Aye. Chris Hassler. Okay, so we need to read that. Chris Hassler. Uh, Chris may have stepped away. I'll skip over him. Dale Aye. Ketchum. Okay, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Dale Ketchum. Aye. Kate Cronmiller. Aye. Steve Lindsay. Aye. Mike Lovis. Aye. Clay Mori. Aye. Dale Nash. Aye. Sharon Pickerton. Sharon, are you with us? All right. Lee Rosen. Lee had to drop off for a few. Got it. Robbie Sabatier? Aye. Eric Stalmer? Aye. Ann Zikolsky? Aye. And the vice chair votes yes. Charity, uh, the chair, how does the chair vote? Yeah, I vote aye. Thank you. Excellent.
So we had two absent. Clay, if you want to move on to task two and just let us know when you're ready to uh, for us to take the vote. Any additional discussion on this topic? This is the good enough application item. Just this is the good there. enough application. I okay. know I, I got a, a, a text that Ann Zikulski's on if there are any other uh, who, who, who is the primary lead on this one, if anyone has any questions. Uh, and I helped uh, quite a bit on it. So happy to answer any questions that might be out there on complete enough. If there is no discussion, uh, then I would move uh, with the recommendation. The five, the uh, we had five recommendations were included in our um, in our tasker here uh, that the comp stack would adopt uh, the uh, recommendations provided for the uh, complete enough application uh, streamlining process. Second for Shanna. Okay, excellent. We will go through the same process here. Uh, Jim Armour. Aye. Greg Autry. Aye. Bill Beckman. Bill. Aye. Thank you, Bill. Ed Bolton. Aye. Shanna Dale. Aye. Paul Dampus. Aye. Mary Lynn Didmar. Aye. Mike French. Aye. Chris Hassler? Aye. Dale Ketchum? Sorry, aye. Kate Cronemiller? Aye. Steve Lindsay? Aye. Aye. Clay Mowry? Aye. Dale Nash? Aye. Sharon Pinkerton? I assume Sharon must have dropped off. And Lee Rosen, are you back? Probably not. Robbie Sabatier? Aye. Eric Stalmer? Aye. Ann Sikulski? Aye. And vice chair votes yes. How does the chair vote? I vote aye. Excellent. On to task three, Clay, back to you. So again, I open up uh, if there's any questions regarding the international dual licensing approach. We have Mike French who, who led the effort on the call again for his, uh, thank you again, and for his expertise on answering any questions. There are uh, 12 uh, recommendations that that, that fall inside <laughs> of this. Um, of this tasker. Uh, so are there, let me open that up if there are any questions relating to it. Clay, I think Bill had a question here on this item. Bill, did you want to ask? Sure. Can you hear me? Am I doing all right with my mute challenge? All right. Thank you. You're great. So just looking at, you know, how much uh, bandwidth does FAA have? I mean, we, we, I think we did a good job of scrimmaging to say what are all the options out there. One of them was looking at the definition of a U.S. citizen. And I'm guessing FAA is, does not have the, the utmost authority in, in redefining that. So um, who else would we have to pull into that, that discussion and, and revisit? This is Mike. I'll, I'll, I'll take this if that works, Charity. Great, go ahead, Mike. Go for it. Uh, excellent. So, so uh, just uh, taking a step back, if you look at uh, sort of how we put the tasker together, we had a series of items there at the end that we essentially said, look, this is, this is not something we're going to be able to agree to right away. If there, was, if there was interest in exploring it further, it's going to take some more work. And this U.S. citizen one falls in that category. Because uh, if to, in, to make that sort of change at the end of the day will require, you know, a congressional change to the statute. So um, this, along with the, you know, some of those other exploration ideas are, are, are written uh, to tell AST, you know, this is not the front burner, right? These are things that um, as, you know, resources or time allow, you could explore further that may have, may, may have a fruitful ground for the issue. Uh, but but not you know the do tomorrow uh, type type items. So and I think we we, we tried to lay that out in the, in the longer paper uh, just to make clear where where things really have that that heavy lift. Does does that answer your question, Bill? Perfectly. Thank you, Mike. Bill, were you, let me just ask, Bill, were you were you trying to find like the with the State Department help in something like that, or is that was that too granular? I, I was just trying to you know to say you know it's. It's a discussion that's going to have to go well beyond FAA. So, you know, 
I, I know that we were casting the, the net wide and looking at the art of the possible with this one. I just wanted to make sure, you know, we, we had a little bit of understanding of how far we had to go with this discussion. Okay. Very good. Any other comments or discussion with respect to task tasker three? I guess just a quick one uh, from Mike on resources as well. I mean, this would requires heavy state department department um, support, I think as well. Do you have any sense of additional resources that might be needed to implement some of these dual um, uh, dual licensing items? Yeah, so the, the way I think about it is not that it would take new resources, rather when do the resources that currently get used start um, uh, getting involved, right? So, um, you know, currently uh, the State Department will be involved at these different points. And, and the recommendations here are trying to be, um, try to provide some guidance to ASC that in some cases, starting that clock or starting that engagement with state may be beneficial because that will often be a multi-year process um, versus waiting uh, a little further along uh, in, in the application process. So I'd say um, more of a, when do you turn on existing resources versus, uh, you know, really looking to create more work for, for either entity. Thank you. If there are no other comments or questions, uh, Karina, I would uh, propose that uh, Comstack vote on the recommendations under Tasker 3 on international dual licensing and the recommendations that follow there for, for approval. Second. Thank you, Shanna. Great. Uh, Jim Armour. Uh, hi, this was nice work. Hi. Thanks. Greg Autry? Aye. Bill Beckman. Aye. Ed Bolton. Are you uh, Jim? Nice work. Aye. Thanks, Ed. Shanna Dale. Aye. 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 Paul Dampus. Aye. Mary Lynn. Agree. Comprehensive view. Um, aye. Great. Mike French. Uh, aye. Thanks. Chris Hassler. Aye. Dale Ketchum. Aye. Kate Cronmiller. Aye. Steve Lindsay. Aye. Mike Moses. Aye. Thanks, Mike. Clay Mowry. Aye. Dale Nash. Dale. Come back to Dale in a moment. Sharon Pickerton. Can't tell whether she's rejoined. Uh, Lee Rosen. Uh, Robbie Sabatier? Aye. Great. Eric Stalmer? Aye. Ann Sikulski? Aye. Vice Chair votes yes. And how does the chair vote? I vote aye. Thank you. Uh, Dale Nash, are you with us? If you are, you're muted. Okay, so we had three absent from that vote. And the motion passes. Um, any additional items from the regulatory working group? None, none that I can think of. Shanna, did you have anything to add? Nothing to add, thank you. Great. So Charity, we have a little bit of time before lunch. Do you, uh, do you all wanna stop now or do you wanna move into I&I &I and, &I and uh, pick up the schedule? I think this might be a good time to see if Greg would like to give his safety group, safety working group update. Uh, not to put you on the spot, Greg, but if you're ready, we can do that now and then we'll break for lunch. Um, sure, wasn't expecting that, but, uh, but we'll do our best here. So uh, thank you. Uh, the safety working group uh, actually delivered on our taskers in the last meeting in September. So I'm just gonna, take two minutes uh, here to, uh, to recap uh, what we did at, uh, at that time. Just a moment. 
I know it's not that big. Huh? So uh, back in September, um, we reported on our taskers at that time. Um, we were tasked with formulating human spaceflight best practices to guide industry in anticipation of updates to the regulations upon exploration of the moratorium uh, that was put in place under the 2015 uh, Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. Uh, for those that don't know, um, basically there is a moratorium on uh, regulating uh, for the uh, safety of the uh, participants in human spaceflight until 2023. The purpose of that moratorium was under the assumption that uh, this is an industry that's immature. We don't know enough about the technologies and the operations yet to uh, create effective regulations and industry needs a chance to standardize just as we went through with the, the aircraft industry at the time. Um, whether the moratorium is extended again or not, uh, it seems wise to be prepared uh, to have some discussions with industry and some plans on where we would go, uh, presuming that would happen. Uh, specifically, we were asked to uh, determine the extent to which voluntary consensus standards uh, could be used by industry uh, and identify uh, groups or individuals that were already working on uh, potential uh, uh, products. Um, we observed that the commercial space flight industry, uh, while providing the public, doesn't have uh, the specificity to mandate uh, uh, or address uh, non-crew participant safety at this time. Um, the Comstack determined that uh, the industry is still learning, but it has valuable knowledge uh, on which to build some standards and to inform potential future regulations when the moratorium uh, terminates. Uh, we recommended that the FAA form a Commercial Space Flight Safety Rulemaking Committee, uh, uh, SRC, to uh, focus industry efforts on voluntary standards developments and help the space community apply relevant lessons learned on commercial space flight as well as in human space flight. Uh, the SWG also reviewed uh, existing commercial space flight standards, uh, and we found that while the industry has contributed significant time and effort to standards development, uh, there's been a slow process, and that's not uncommon in, in industries. We recommended that FAA retain a systems engineering and technical services organization uh, to conduct the uh, required independent review uh, on readiness for an involved commercial space flight uh, safety network, and that was required under the Commercial Space Launch Act Amendment of 2015. Um, our recommendation three was that uh, uh, a standardized reporting structure is called for, that FAA develop a reportable uh, incident database with the goal to provide public access for certain safety critical data based on required uh, informed consent process. And um, those were all, uh, all supported. Uh, we also noted that uh, Companies should implement internal safety reporting systems that would eventually integrate to a future industry-wide uh, voluntary safety system. This would be similar to the Aviation Safety Action Program, ASAP, used in commercial aviation. Um, we also saw that several uh, standard setting organizations had done work on standards for space flight safety, and most notably uh, ASTM's F-47 group. Uh, which uh, is headed up by, um, or was by Michael Lopez Alegrea, who uh, came uh, from, from the Comstack. Uh, we recommended that FAA and Comstack continue to support the ASTM uh, uh, Committee on Commercial Space Flight uh, and the Technical Standards Organization, responsible for US commercial industry consensus standards. Uh, we were informed in these decisions by uh, feedback from uh, the relevant human, uh, Space flight organizations, the firms that look like they would be flying uh, uh, human space flight uh, in the next year, uh, as well as uh, is from other companies on the Comstack and beyond. And uh, that is uh, pretty much what we did last year and uh, looking forward to our new taskers uh, coming up for this year. Thank you, Greg. Um, so at this time, I, I wanna see if there are any comments, suggestions or discussion from 
our ComStack members. But before I do that, I do, uh, on, for this, I do have one more thing to add, and I apologize. Oh, sure, go ahead. Got off guard by moving, uh, being moved up. Uh, you know, the heavy, the heavy lifting on on this was. Uh, to a great extent, uh, uh, done by uh, my co-chair, Robbie Sabathier, uh, 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 United Launch Alliance. And I have to thank everybody on the, uh, the safety working group team for, uh, for contributing, but uh, could not have gotten this done on time uh, uh, and, uh, and ahead of everybody else if, if Robbie hadn't uh, really been there to make sure that it happened during the summer. So thank you. I second that. Robbie, did you want to add anything? Thanks, Charity. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. Uh, Greg and I spent a lot of time um, on my summer vacation working on this safety working group report. And um, I was happy to hear from Administrator Dickinson on um, how pleased he was with our recommendations, particularly on the robust, robust reporting program. So I think it makes it all worthwhile. And uh, Greg and I are uh, going to be gearing up, obviously, for our next assignment, which uh, we've already been given a heads up to. So thank you. Thanks, Robbie. I, I just want to foot stomp uh, what it was. It was great to hear Mr. Dixon talk about implementation of Comstack, Comstack's re recommendations. Um, that was really great to hear that and, and that sort of feedback um, is important to us. So just a, a note for FAA, uh, thank you for providing that feedback to us. So we have a little bit of time before we break for lunch. Um, I'd like to offer if, if Comstock members have any discussion items from regulatory working group or safety working group, now's the time to bring that up. Uh, we will have a new business opportunity later this afternoon as well. And also want to, uh, for, for those that um, are in the public spaces here today, if you have any questions on our discussions from this morning, suggestions, comments, questions, uh, type them in now and we will moderate those and answer as many as we can before lunch. I'll give you a couple minutes to type them in. Jim, do we have anything coming in, either YouTube or Facebook? I just checked and nothing is coming in over the email. Okay, um, that's fine. We'll have plenty more uh, time to bring in any discussion or comment. Uh, with that, I'd like to recommend we break for lunch. And Jim, what time would you like us back? Uh, let's, let's come back. Uh, it is now uh, just a little after 11:45. Uh, the associate or the uh, deputy administrator uh, begins speaking at 12:45, so an hour from now. So if we could all be back, uh, logged in, ready to go at uh, say 12:40, that would be perfect. Um, and I'll be on a little bit earlier, so if somebody has questions, we can get those lined up. But if we can all be back at 1240 uh, and then we can get started again, that'd be perfect. Okay, enjoy your lunch. All right, thank you everybody. And we'll see you after lunch.